Hello and welcome to today's webinar, COPD, Facing the Challenges of Complexity and Engagement. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded and an online archive of today's event will be available within 24 hours. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen on a PC or Command R if you're using a Mac. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing enter. And finally, I'd like to remind you of AHIP's antitrust statement located in the link just below the slide viewer. We will, as always, comply with that statement. Among other things, the antitrust statement prohibits us from discussing competitively sensitive information. We are very fortunate today to have with us Dr. Eric Harker, Michael Zagami, and Christina Nelson from Nouveau Air. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to Christina. Hi, thank you all for joining today. Uh, happy to be here. Before we begin, wanted to take a second to introduce you to our team. Starting with myself, I'm Tina Nelson. I'm the Vice President of Partnerships here at Nouveau Air. I joined Nouveau Air because I am from rural Kansas and as such, access is very, very close to my heart and those with respiratory conditions have long since been left out. Prior to Nouveau Air, I spent time at Omada and One Call. And today I am also joined by my colleagues, as mentioned, Dr. Eric Harker and Mike Zagami. Dr. Harker is our chief medical officer. He guides our clinical protocols and engagement. Previously, you could find Dr. Harker leading initiatives at Iora Health and Kaiser. Also with me today is Mike Zagami. He's our chief product officer and he oversees our virtual first solution. Mike is a real wealth of information regarding engagement and product design, having led product teams at Eliza, HMS and Cotivity. Before we get started, I wanted to take a minute to introduce you to Nouveau Air. We are a mission driven digital health company focused on building solutions across the care continuum. When we were founded in 2016, it was in an effort to improve the lives of millions living with complex conditions. We began our journey in the respiratory space, of course, and have served over 7,000 patients thus far, and we've collected over a million data points around respiratory through our partnerships, like those with uh, the NHS in the UK and others. Before we get started, uh, we're going to spend 40 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to focus on the state of COPD. We're going to talk about the current approaches and our most recent pilot. Please feel free to pop into uh, the chat any questions that you might have, and we'll also be adding in some polls questions along the way. With that, I'm going to go ahead and invite Dr. Harker up to ground us in the state of COPD, COPD today. Eric? Thanks, Tina. I'm happy to be here. Uh, as promised, I'm going to go off script for a minute. And uh, I know my team is like grabbing their seats, but um, I turned 50 yesterday. And so I was reflecting on that as I as I often do, um, because uh, my dad died of, of lung cancer just before his um, 40th birthday. And, um, you know, so that that's obviously had a, a huge impact on my life and my my family's life. And um, yeah, he um, he suffocated uh, while his his mom, my grandma, was washing his hair. Um, and I, I think about that word because a lot of our patients, particularly in the South, will use the word uh, suffocate uh, to describe their shortness of breath. So, you know, patients describe dealing with COPD as as the the suffocating. Um, and I just sort of wanted to ground us with with that. Um, Thinking about you know these cases, we're going to talk about costs. We're going to talk about hospitaliz hospitalizations and things like that. But every single one of these cases um, just involves uh, suffering uh, and, and really a significant impact on uh, patients and their families. So, uh, with that, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, this, the state of COPD in the U.S. Um, at a high level, just to to be blunt, um, the state of, of COPD in the U.S. is um, the, the burden is great, and we're not doing as well uh, as we should be doing. Um, so looking at this, this slide, we can see that um, about 30 million people are suffering from COPD, but only about half of them are actually diagnosed. The other half are, are hidden from view and, and don't have an opportunity to, to be treated. Um, 
it's expensive. Uh, approximately $50 billion a year is spent on COPD in the US. And about 70% of that comes from COPD related hospitalizations, uh, which are about $20,000 each. COPD hospitalizations are particularly expensive. Medicare and Medicaid pay the majority of those costs, but the cost to commercial payers is also very high. Um, it's important to note that the majority of hospitalizations, 63%, uh, result from COPD exacerbations. Um, so it's important when you're, when you're talking about addressing COPD to talk about exacerbations. So this is really important. Um, as a community, this is a statement from the, the Lancet um, uh, a group on uh, COPD, uh, Lancet Commission on COPD. As a community, our focus needs to be redirected towards the COPD patient and improving overall care that will prevent the first admission, um, not just uh, the readmission. And here's why. So every COPD exacerbation uh, drives a downward spiral of disease progression. Hospitalization it causes depression, disability, and death. Um, in a very large review of uh, first COPD hospital admissions, 20% of patients died within a year and 50% died within three to four years. Along the way, they're facing a lot of disability, hospitalizations, ER visits, office visits. Um, so the, the exacerbations drive uh, a, a huge amount of um, uh, mo morbidity and, and mortality. Look at this, exacerbations are associated with major depression in half of patients, anxiety in two thirds of patients. PTSD in a third, um, heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, frailty, falls, and institutionalization all follow from exacerbations. If you prevent and manage exacerbations, you'll control costs and you'll alle alleviate suffering. So if members with COPD don't exacerbate their conditions, if, if patients with COPD don't exacerbate, their conditions and costs won't escalate. Sorry, that's a, a nod to my fellow CMO, CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer, Mary. All right, so let's zoom in on hospitalizations a little bit more. So COPD is reported to be the eighth leading cause of hospitalizations ahead of depression, renal failure, stroke, and only behind sepsis, pneumonia, heart disease, diabetes, and musculoskeletal. Um, but how is it that the third leading cause of death and disability in the US is reported as only the eighth cause of hospitalization? One reason is only half of COPD or less are recognized and diagnosed. So a lot of COPD morbidity is hidden in the data because COPD is not diagnosed adequately. The other consideration, if you look at this table, the number one cause of hospitalization is septicemia. Number four is pneumonia. But sepsis and pneumonia doesn't happen in the absence of underlying conditions. Most of those admissions are in patients with complex conditions such as COPD, CHF, diabetes, and so forth. So to lower your risk of, of hospitalization and of sepsis and pneumonia, focus on managing complex diseases like COPD and heart failure. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about undiagnosed COPD. The reasons are many, including lack of access to specialists, particularly in rural and other underserved areas, poor access to and poor quality of spirometry in primary care, low engagement levels of patients who often lost faith in the healthcare system or lost confidence in their own ability to maintain their health. But there's good news. Our work in the UK and the US suggests that up to 32% of patients, if you look uh, into this population and try to find those cases of COPD, up to 32% of those patients will test positive uh, with obstruction on spirometry. So we can find members with previously undiagnosed COPD. And we'll see in the next slide that we can actually improve the care of those patients with integrated solutions. All right, so the evidence on um, managing COPD. And uh, I have to say I was limited to, to only uh, nine citations. So as a good internist, I tried to fill the page with um, references. Um, 
So patients with COPD are receiving care, but too often uh, via siloed solutions, which on their own are limited by very low engagement and limited to no improvement in outcomes. The literature shows that only when solutions are integrated, leveraging both technology and relationship-based care, do we see improvements at scale. So look at the results here. Number needed to treat to reduce uh, hospital admissions, four, uh, to reduce or to avoid an at urgent outpatient visit, uh, 1.5, uh, cutting hospital readmissions in half. Um, so the, the results are, are impressive. Systematic reviews of the literature show that in order to be successful, these programs have to show four things. One is risk stratification. You have to match the resources to the severity of the patients that you're managing. Number two is accurate monitoring to detect exacerbations and disease progression. If you're not monitoring, you can't impact the, the population at scale. You have to provide personalized and timely care, meaning access to a team, not just an app. Tech alone will not improve the health of your population. And number four is collaboration and self-management. And this requires strong engagement. So we can't continue to invest, to invest in care management programs that engage 13% of the population and at great cost, or in pulmonary rehab programs that could be effective but only engage about 3% of participate, participants. So we owe more to our patients. Let's pause for a minute uh, to take a quick survey, and then we'll talk about uh, current state. What type of program does your organization offer today in supporting COPD patients? Check all that apply. Care management, telehealth, population health, pulmonary rehabilitation, digital health solutions, or other. Thank you. We have answers coming in. Looks like by far the most common answer here is care management, and that is consistent with what we've seen. But we do see some telehealth and some pop health, pulmonary rehab coming in with a couple as well. Dr. Harker, uh, I know that we see a lot of care management. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, and maybe some quick thoughts on pulmonary rehab. Yeah. So there is some good evidence that um, certain types of care management can impact populations. Um, in particular, if you if you focus on hospital transitions, uh, you can lower the, the risk of readmission in COPD patients, which is important because COPD is one of the top uh, three causes of hospital readmissions. Um, the, the problem is, uh, one, it's engagement. Um, most patients don't actually participate in care management. And so the limited engagement really just uh, puts a cap on how much you're able to affect the population. Um, so that's number one. The, the other thing is that um, it's very hard to manage a population at scale with care management, at least in the absence of monitoring. So historically, uh, care management programs uh, would allow a nurse to take care of, say, 50 to 100 patients. Um, and think about the nurse and how they're spending their time. Most of their time, they're, they're spending trying to get in touch with the patient, which is really wasted time. And so what I would suggest if you're, if you're looking to take care management to the next level, one, you've got to couple it with a remote, remote monitoring. So you know when that patient's having a problem, and that's when you need to reach out to the patient. And number two, you need to couple it with a really robust engagement program. So you should be automating the majority of the efforts going into reaching out to patients. And you can't rely on phone. You've got to use text. You've got to use email. It's got to be multimodal. And that could get your engagement rates up from currently it's probably 13% of care management uh, reaching patients. You want to get that up about, you know, above 50% certainly. Um, pulmonary rehab, great evidence of benefit. Uh, patients improve their uh, functional status, their quality of life. It can lead to uh, reduced costs of care. Uh, the problem is about 3% of patients who are eligible participate in pulmonary rehab. So it's really, um, really disappointing uh, how poorly we've done with actually getting patients into pulmonary rehab. And so, you know, one interesting space I would say is uh, the idea of home-based virtual pulmonary rehab, because the barriers that you have to pulmonary rehab it's the cost of copays. It's the difficulty of coming in uh, to the hospital-based programs or the outpatient-based programs. So virtual pulmonary rehab at home is something that we've put a lot of effort into and, um, and we're excited about. 
Thanks, Eric. Yeah. So this is where uh, I'll pick it up. And uh, so uh, again, this is Mike Zagami. I, I, uh, I'm a product guy, uh, but I cut my teeth in engagement, primarily member engagement across the spectrum of uh, markets in the healthcare space. And so when I talk about engagement, that makes me a pseudo expert in human behavior and psychology, I guess. And uh, one of the phrases I've lived by as a engagement slash product guy is it's 100% easier to do nothing than it is to do something, anything. And I think that's even more so true when it comes to doing something new, um, breaking out of an old pattern of behavior. And I think that applies also to not just to uh, member engagement or consumer engagement, but also to obviously businesses and how they approach problems. So, you know, you're familiar, and, and we just did the survey, so that's great, but you're familiar with a lot of the solutions out there to address uh, COPD. And likely if you've implemented these, and thanks to Eric for, for highlighting a few of the, the benefits, um, but also some of the limitations as well, you're, you're all familiar with, with likely the benefits and limitations. Now, I have two major factors that I like to consider across the board here. It's how does a solution uh, include enough acute specialty, and, and in this case, we'll talk about COPD, to adequately address the nuances of that condition, but also the very real human aspects of having a condition, and that includes comorbidities, it includes socioeconomic factors, and a variety of individual human circumstance and motivations. It's a very difficult uh, thing to manage, as, as everybody knows. Um, but what if we could get the best of what these solutions have historically offered and currently offer and eliminate and resolve the limitations that are known? Um, we know that incentive misalignment and capability gaps have really caused the inertia here. But I think most of us would agree that the environment is definitely changing and it's only a matter of time. We actually think the time is now, not only because the environment is changing, but also because the way humans are engaging with their care is also changing. Their desires are changing. And so we did consider that. In fact, uh, we actually conducted a survey and uh, in the survey, we uh, just completed it in June of 22. More than uh, four, uh, 500 people, 300 of them were directly diagnosed with uh, COPD, and 200 of them were actually caregivers of individuals with COPD. And the results of what we found really reaffirm what most of us know intuitively. And we need to do a better job of managing COPD for these patients and also helping their caregivers. Um, and especially, I want to illuminate uh, some of the caregiver aspects of this, which, you know, really surprised me, but maybe it shouldn't have. So we know that people with COPD are complex, and maybe a better way to say it is we know that there are people with some common and consistent complexities. In particular, nearly 50% of the people we surveyed had more than five comorbidities, and nearly 50% have one or more SDOH concerns. Um, I'll take a look at how many pa how patients are actually prioritizing their conditions. So only 25% of patients say that it's a top priority compared with 50 52% of caregivers saying that uh, COPD is a top priority. So this basically is illuminating the fact that of the many things that a patient has to has to manage, it was curious that only 25% said it was a top priority and such a stark difference between how caregivers perceived it. And I think it's even more illuminating when you, when you cross compare that with the self-reported uh, success that patients and caregivers alike um, said that they had in managing the condition. And maybe one thought is, you know, maybe, maybe it can be why prioritize something, you know, if it's, really unlikely that you'll succeed at managing it because it's so complicated. Now you might notice that 52% of the patients actually say they feel successful in their management, but 
sometimes you know self reports can can skew some things and and it's great if they do but you counter that with what the what the actual caregivers are saying um and also you couple it with the fact that and we'll get to this in a in a few slides that almost across every strat that we did every cut that we did even the patients that said that they were successful currently said that they could use help so we'll get to that in in a second but an example of help and and we just discussed this right with care management um we wanted to run actually a perception that patients have and caregivers have of uh, care management, because we also felt intuitively that it was going to be one of the more common installations that that health plans used to manage populations. And we found that only, uh, of the of the patients we surveyed, 47% knew about care management, and fewer than 20% had actually used it. And according to a McKinsey uh, survey, only 6% of patients who used care management had a lower risk of unplanned hospital readmission. And that again reinforces the concept that even though it can be difficult to do something new, sometimes the data just smack you in the face and say you have to. And we know we can do better. So what we did was we described what better could look like. We took the time in the survey that we conducted to describe a new type of solution, one that is virtual first, one that pairs the devices and biomarkers that are sort of akin to RPM solutions, but with bi-directional self-reported engagement capabilities, a solution that would offer coaches, nurses, specialty physicians who come to understand the patient and really know their needs over time, who really could get ahead of exacerbations before they actually occur. We described all this for patients and what we found was 72% of patients and 95% of caregivers said they would be very likely to use these services. We thought that was really compelling. But it kind of makes sense, right? Given the fact that low utilization and low knowledge of existing uh, capabilities and also uh, potentially challenges in just complexity in managing the population. But we weren't we weren't kind of satisfied just there. We wanted to cut the data a little bit further to see if there was anything interesting behind that interest. And what we found was generally in every cohort, and I mentioned this, every cohort that we cut, the majority of that cohort was interested, and not just nominally interested. We saw consistent increases in interest as we exposed them to uh, variables like tech capability, whether or not they have the ability to use various devices or um, you know, mobile apps and, and uh, digital capabilities, uh, social needs and perceived severity of their condition. Now, the point of this slide is to highlight you know, that interest exists regardless of the cut or cohort. But of course, there are going to be subsets in any cohort, right? The black that you see here that are not interested, or at least they express that they're not interested. And remember, it's 100% easier to do nothing than it is to do something, especially when it's something new. So you can imagine some hesitance and some skepticism. But should we just forget about these individuals, right? The ones that are difficult to engage? Sometimes that's what, what a solution recommends, only focus on this cohort or that cohort. But that's another key factor, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So the previous cuts of data that we talked about focused on abilities and perceptions that patients have. But we were also interested in cuts that illustrated a likelihood to try the service based on current care decisions. And so we found it really interesting that 71% of people who uh, did not use care management, said that they would be interested in the service that we described, while 80% who actually had used care management also said they'd be interested in the service. But surprisingly, and surprisingly to me anyway, we found that regardless of how frequently patients actually saw their treating physician at brick and mortar, in this case it would be a pulmonologist, 
patients were approximately 70% 70, 70 likely to use the service we described. Now that was kind of mind blowing. So individuals who saw their uh, pulmonologist once a month were still very likely to use the service. Individuals who saw their pulmonologist once a year were likely to use the service. And the caregivers who we surveyed not only echoed that sentiment, but they really put an exclamation point behind it. I mean, across the board, nearly 100% of the caregivers we surveyed said that they'd be likely to use a service like this. And that kind of screams how challenging, you know, it is to manage the condition. And remember, the survey was conducted with 500 COPD patients and caregivers, so it wasn't a small sample. And in short, there's, a, there's an appetite for virtual first COPD solutions. The landscape is changing. And, um, you know, it's not just us that's, that's saying it. All the indicators are pointing to it. So consider this uh, soundbite from McKinsey. 75% of the respondents in this McKinsey survey said that they preferred digital solutions for monitoring their health, and 71% preferred uh, digital solutions for checking their health data. Personalization is also becoming critical. So adding the digital aspect and the personalization aspect to the idea of this virtual first uh, solution, we think we're onto something. And that's exactly what we're working on uh, at NuvoAir. So uh, before we get into some of the details of that, we, we do have another survey. So we'll head over to that now. For those of you that offer a solution for managing your complex patients diagnosed with COPD, Please share how efficient you find your current solution to be on a scale of one to five, where one means not efficient and five means extremely efficient. Not efficient, a bit efficient, somewhat efficient, very efficient, or extremely efficient. Awesome, thank you. Right away, a whole lot of not efficient and a bit efficient. I don't think that's all that surprising. Uh, if anybody answers extremely efficient, we'd like to absolutely talk to you after the call, but I haven't seen any of those yet. Dr. Harker, do you have any thoughts on the 50% thus far? Oh, we just dropped to 43 uh, on the not efficient and a bit efficient. Yeah, thanks, Tina. Um, you know, I've, I've been working on these kinds of programs for somewhere in the 15 to 20 year range, and um, uh, I, I've I've seen a lot of different approaches to it, and and I agree. I think most of them have been very um, inefficient, and it goes back to I think it goes back to to what I mentioned before, which is um, the care coordinators, uh, care managers, they spend most of their time trying to get in touch with patients, and they're not able to do it at the time that the member needs to be reached. Right? You have a list of patients, and and, and you you have a spreadsheet. Or something like that, uh, you know, and you're going down and you're trying to touch base with them. Usually, it's after a hospitalization, um, which, as I mentioned before, after the hospitalization, you know, you've already kind of lost the opportunity to prevent the exacerbation that is now caused, worsening of lung function, which leads to progression of disease, that that downward spiral of COPD. So it can't just be at, at hospital discharge, and it can't be temporary, but I think the reason that we, we stick with hospital-based short-term interventions is the efficiency. Um, so again, if you, if you can build a system that's got the measurements and the monitoring to connect with patients at that first sign of them having a problem, whether it's their, their symptoms are flaring up, their oxygen is going down, their spirometry is showing worsening disease, um, then you can scale the, the, the population and manage a much bigger population. And then again, you have to have some sort of engagement system that takes care of all that background work of connecting with patients so that your care coordinators, that human part, um, is really focused on meaningful conversations with patients, um, showing empathy, building trust on um, that relationship-based uh, piece. 
So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, it's that personalization piece, I think. Uh, back to you, Mike, I believe. All right, great. Well, I thought it was really telling that uh, we didn't get actually any responses, it looks like, in the very efficient or extremely efficient um, uh, range. And, you know, I think that speaks to just how challenging it is to do what we're, what we're discussing today. Um, so we hear that and uh, we echo that and that's, that's why we're here. We want to talk about ways that we can, we can alleviate some of that burden, both for, you know, organizations that really care, and, but also obviously for the patients and, and caregivers who try and care for them. So I'm going to bring us back a little bit to three factors that I mentioned earlier, and I mentioned them in, in a couple different sections. So the three factors were, um, how can a solution have enough acute specialty to be effective in a condition like COPD with enough flexibility to account for human factors like comorbidities, SDOH, which can include things like you know, tech capability and health literacy, and three, the fact that some people just don't engage the way we want them to. Again, that inherent human inertia, um, 100% easier to do nothing than it is to do something. Well, we've built a solution that really pulls a thread through those three factors. So we have, as we mentioned, patients leave breadcrumbs and trails. We all do, we all do. Breadcrumbs and trails of data, obviously. And any virtual solution needs to figure out a way to get access to those data, but without all of the big brother stigma and of course all the proper consents that you actually need to have in place. So it is effective to have an ecosystem of biomarkers to capture, but biomarkers only tell a part of the story and the utilization of biomarkers is a challenge. Uh, utilization of devices that capture biomarkers can be a challenge not to mention challenges with connectivity. But we'll get to that in a second. The data that gets generated from those biomarkers are also valuable, but arguably there can be too much data. And so it's critical that any data asset has an insights layer that's built on top of it, which includes a combination of a clinical protocol that's really well defined as well as an engagement protocol that's really well defined and when you marry those two together you become really adept at looking for signals that indicate when next best action needs to occur and those are the insights that the derived layer of insights on top of just the base level uh, of data that you might get and arguably and this this goes back to let's say i don't know 100 plus conversations i've had with payers in the past, the mountain of data can become almost worse than no data. Uh, I like to call it shut-in syndrome. It's like you have so much data that you don't know what to do with it and you don't know how to make, make signals out of the noise. Now I mentioned biomarker data being a part of it, but there's another layer and it's engagement data. So the key to kind of unlocking the insights and actually feeding the insights is a robust engagement layer, one that includes a blend of automation. There are so many fantastic tools out there today that if you weave them together, you really have a robust automated uh, digital uh, environment, but also a live component. And each of those produce data and so if you combine the biomarker aspect and not only just the, the, device, the data you get from the devices, but also the absence of data can be a telling story as well. If you combine that data asset with an engagement asset and you produce a data insights engine on top of that, you can feed a decision engine that not only informs future automation, what should I send out next? What, do, what, uh, what reading is missing? Is Am I needing a new SPO2? Is this a bad SPO2 range? 
take all of the manual intervention out of that and you feed it back into your decision engine. And now your decision engine is telling your automation what to do next, but it's also reporting to the fourth element here. And that's a virtual care team. So a, a really robust team that can manage the variety of insights that you are deriving. So there could be insights like, oh, we haven't heard from this individual in three days. What should we do next? Oh, there's an automated outreach going out. We don't have to do anything. Oh, this person has a history of exacerbations. We need to call that individual. So there's that level, but then there's also a level of these signals are, are alarming according to our, our clinical protocol. We need to have either a registered nurse or a specialty like a pulmonologist look at the signals and then make a determination about reaching out to that individual, that patient and scheduling an appointment and potentially escalating even from there. And so this environment is the reality now as a virtual first option that helps to, again, enhance the benefits of the solutions that are out there today, but also improve the efficiencies of each of those solutions and resolve many of the limitations of those solutions. Now, there's a question out there, and, and rightly so. It, it, this is the, the, one of the big questions. So you can do all of this, but how do you tell if it's working or not? And outcomes can be a challenge, obviously, across the board. We don't have to go into too many details probably about that. But we're obviously focused on really key things like preventing exacerbations, reducing hospital stays, helping to avoid ER use, um, improving overall health status, and then some critical KPIs leading to those things like you know, are people adhering to their medication? Are they adhering to the clinical protocol we've set out? Are they engaging with the channels that we've put in front of them? But I call this a meta layer. So while we're waiting for outcomes to, to come through and while we're actually looking for like small incremental improvements that an individual can make through a solution like this, how do you know if it's actually working? Technically, you don't know until let's say there's a Oh, not a hospital visit down the road or the absence of an ER uh, visit down the road. But there's a meta layer and it's a progression layer. And this is kind of rooted in, if you remember, I, I mentioned back at the beginning, a, I have a pseudo uh, expert in behavioral theory being an engagement guy. Pseudo because it's not officially accredited. But uh this meta layer takes us through all the key aspects that you would need to manage and track performance on to know whether your solution is working, even while you wait for claims or um, wait for indicators on the back end that show whether outcomes are there. And what we're looking at are awareness, very simple. How aware are individuals that they have access to a solution? Uh, activation, are they activated in the solution? Are they onboarded in the solution? Enrollment. Enrollment is a, an interesting term, and you could spend a whole another webinar on the concept of enrollment. But for our purposes, it's we have what we need from that individual to continue to engage them in the solution. And for some, that could be as simple as just having their name and their phone number and a yes consent. I want to be a part of this thing. And that could be a, a really nice launching point for a solution. Obviously a management layer, a way to know what to do when signals start coming in, an actually documented, developed, coded approach. The ability to triage. So the first four being kind of your, are they in, are they in a solution and where are they in the solution? Whether or not exacerbations have been tripped and, and then need a triage afterward, right? These are kind of the indicators that you need to keep people on and progress them toward. And if you're monitoring those things and you see good distributions of your population where they should be, you can really get a good sense for how you're managing the diagnosed population. And then of course, kind of a wrapper around this whole visual would be constant evaluation of those KPIs, that continuum, making sure the population is tracking across the board and then mapping that back to outcomes on the back end.
So I'm going to I'm going to pivot now over to Eric. I think we've got a couple more slides here. So uh, Dr. Harker. Thanks, Mike. I love how you referred to yourself as an engagement guy. And it, uh, as I was listening to you and as I've been working with you over you know, the last six months or so, um, I realized that you know, all those years that I was working on uh, you know, population health and prevention programs, uh, a lot of our strategy was really just try harder. And uh, it, you know, it, it didn't work all that well. And uh, so I, I just, you know, advise the audience uh you know if you don't have an engagement guy or an engagement person uh find one it's 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 really key um so anyway yeah we we put together a, a clinical team and uh the, the clinical service um melding the the product that mike and his team uh built uh with a, a team of respiratory therapists predominantly um and we looked to to test our solution um, really in in the so some of the toughest populations that you could find. So this is a an evaluation of our our pilot implementation. Um, so it's a, a twelve month prospective cohort implementation study of fifty patients referred to us with COPD from rural Indiana and Kentucky. Uh, one was primary care clinic and one pulmonary clinic uh, from twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two. So the goal was to assess our ability to engage members. We knew that would be the hardest thing to do. Um, and to see if we could regularly obtain uh, and monitor biomarkers, um, pulse oximetry, spirometry, and so forth. And to see if we could manage patients with this um, new tech-enabled clinical service. Um, so patients were asked to monitor pulse oximetry, spirometry, respiratory symptoms. Uh, they're coached to contact their care coordinators with any increase in symptoms. And care coordinators were tasked with onboarding members to the devices, going through the tech onboarding and, and problem solving. Um, and then to provide COPD specific education. What's COPD? What's an exacerbation? How do you recognize it? What do you do when you have it? Uh, and then working with patients on uh, behavior change, uh, coaching on exercise, smoking cessation, and coping with illness. Think back to what I mentioned at you know, half of patients have depression and two thirds have anxiety. A huge driver of utilization in COPD is, is anxiety. And so learning how to sort of cope with the symptoms that you have, often that's uh, one of the most impactful things that you can do. Um, so coordinators monitored the incoming data. They reached out for any signals of exacerbation or disease progression. And um, initially we set up the majority of outreach to be via video visit, but we quickly recognized that most patients um, are only reachable by text or telephone, uh, sometimes email, but uh, text uh, proved to be particularly effective at, at reaching these patients. Um, so that's that's a, a learning for us. We've uh, really sort of refocused our efforts on on building uh, the, the design of the product around uh, text, since that's a, a method that our patients use. So here's some results uh, of the pilot. Of the 50 patients referred, 45 responded to outreach, 37 went through initial onboarding, and of those, uh, 28 engaged and uh, worked with us uh, up to a year. Um, so this 56% engagement rate, which um, is really quite remarkable, and most of them stayed with us for uh, up to a year. Patients measured their biomarkers and reported symptoms regularly, a pulse ox on average every two days, spirometry every nine, we're looking for, for weekly, so almost right on schedule. Um, and uh, uh, respiratory assess assessments every uh, 15 days. Um, since we've modified our approach a little bit to where we're looking more frequently at patient reported symptoms, so looking at a, a daily action plan essentially to sort out, you know, are you feeling uh, well today? Are you doing as well or better than usual? If so, great, that's all the work you gotta do. Um, you know, if you're having more shortness of breath, more cough, or if we see a, a, a sign of uh, increased use of uh, rescue medications, or your activities going down, or um, uh, pulse oximeter is going down, then we're gonna we're gonna reach out to you. So again, we've we've tried to learn as much as we can from this pilot, um, and uh, we're, we're proud of the results. So here's some patient reported uh, data from the end of the end of the study.
Okay, so you can read more about the, our experience and findings um, from the pilot on our white paper linked on our website, but here are a couple of um, um, high level uh, points. Uh, so the majority of patients found that care coordinators uh, made the enrollment and testing easier, which is important because this is not a group of, of uh, members who were uh, particularly uh, tech savvy or, or high tech uh, literacy to start with. Um, they rated their interactions with care coordinators as extremely useful. Um, and um, uh, the, the service experience was very high. So beyond showing that we could engage them and monitor uh, their biomarkers, patients also self-reported fewer hospitalizations and exacerbations. Um, so 80% of patients uh, reported decreased use of hospitalization in ER, um, which is impressive. Again, it's, it's self-reported data. This is an early pilot. We understand that. Um, but we tracked ER and hospital visits as closely as possible, um, with some limitations given the fact that these are small rural clinics without a whole lot of uh, capacity capabilities with data. But we saw about 20% of the ER visits and hospitalization that we would expect in a population like this. Um, so our, our observations matched what patients were telling us uh, on that. 60% decrease in exacerbations overall. 87% uh, reported improvement in uh, quality of life. And that's really why we're all here, as to help people live a better life. 87% uh, increased in uh, confidence in, in managing their health, and an NPS score of, of 60. So we're, we're proud of that. Um, here's an example uh, of a patient in the, uh, from this program. This is Regina. Uh, she's a 71-year-old woman from rural Kentucky. Uh, she's had COPD for about eight years. She also has diabetes. Uh, kidney disease and peripheral artery disease. Um, she doesn't have a caregiver. She spends a lot of her time alone and uh, really focused on trying to manage her own health. She describes her health literacy as relatively low. She didn't use those words, but um, that's what came from our uh, conversations with her. Um, she looked, signed up for us looking for support uh, to manage her health and her underlying motivation, like a lot of our patients, has to do with family. So she wants to be around for her grandkids. And so that's a powerful motivator. Um, so Regina has interacted with Nouveau Air on a, a very regular basis. She uses text as her preferred method of communication. Um, good example of what we can do, Nouveau Air uh, detected a drop in lung function as uh, she was uh, using the spirometry. And her care coordinator reached out to her and to her primary care provider. Um, she was treated with steroids and antibiotics and um, got through that quickly, preventing a more severe uh, flare-up. She's doing well with her COPD. Um, and I would say overall, I think uh, Regina is pretty representative of the type of uh, patients that we need to engage. Complex conditions, often uh, limited tech literacy, um, rural, other underserved areas, um, but is able to use, use text, which we found uh, in, in the majority of our patients. So. So key takeaways from the pilot in particular, what we learned um, from this implementation and what we learned from working with people like Regina. Um, number one, we're able to connect with some of the most difficult to engage uh, patients, particularly in rural populations, um, but only if we level, leverage multiple channels of communication. Um, we're able to manage people with COPD, um, but that means also managing comorbid conditions. These patients have diabetes, they have heart failure, they have kidney disease. Um, you can't manage a patient like that and just say, well, we'll handle the COPD and, and everything else goes to somebody else. So the clinical team needs to have a broad clinical experience and training. So that means nurses with uh, extensive experience uh, managing patients with comorbidities. Um, and then the devices and technology really allowed us to integrate the care um, and to connect them um, connect with our members to provide that uh, relationship-based care um, and empathy. And so from this, uh, this pilot and our learnings, we're, we feel like we're in a really good position to take the next step. 
um, further uh, evidence generation, we think that um, our approach really can transform the way that patients with COPD are, are managed. Mike? Yeah. All right. So we're, thank you all for, for bearing with us. We're going we're gonna to summarize and then we're going to open it up uh, to some questions. Um, so kind of what we're discussing today, obviously, on the concern side, the challenges side, as Eric kind of mentioned already, patients are, with COPD are really just humans that have a consistent set of complexity to manage. Um, the solutions that we have today in the market are siloed, and even as our our survey anecdotally pointed out, that they can often be inefficient. Um, there tends to be a lack of personalization because it's difficult to deliver personaliza personalization at scale, and it's difficult to engage a population, and really even to understand the how engagement can change as you introduce new technologies and new devices. We have to update our understanding of what engagement is. So to think about how we can solve for these things, and I'll talk more kind of sort of theoretical, but but also know that we're we're building, we're building toward that. And we've got a solution that actually can address that. But sort of more in the abstract, in order to be effective here, you've got to be able to manage patients with, with multiple comorbidities and complexities, social determinants of health, in addition to uh, a variety of other conditions. Um, you need to take the best of what the solutions are today while resolving or eliminating where there are limitations. Um, it's important to risk stratify and tailor care as much as possible. And it's a, important to redefine how to engage a population. We talked about omni-channel approaches. We talked about tailoring. And we talked about um, really allowing a, a, a host of data insights to actually inform how you can engage better. So that's kind of a nice summary, I think, of, of what we talked about today. I think. Uh, now we'll pivot back over to you, Tina, and we, we can uh, go with the questions. Yeah, absolutely. So just to kind of summarize uh, your summary there and to close this out, uh, here at NouveauWare, we're certainly looking forward to a future where the norm is this integrated team-based care, uh, one that is both personalized and tech-enabled. Because after all, it's really, it's about making these patients with COPD or other chronic conditions for that matter, feel really supported by the healthcare system, the health insurers, their providers, everyone involved. Uh, you know, when we do that, they're gonna be able to live their best lives uh, and they're gonna be able to live their best lives wherever they want. They don't need to live in a metro area. Uh, they can be rural, they can be at their homes uh, in, in any area. Uh, and that's really when we'll start to see those better outcomes and the cost savings that we're all looking for. Uh, I think this quote really sums that up quite nicely. So as Mike mentioned, we are going to dive into questions. Really appreciate, saw a couple of them come in. I'm gonna get started with the first one here. It says, uh, how do you involve a patient's current providers? I'm gonna go ahead and toss that over to Dr. Harker. Wow. Yeah. Um, great question. Um, there, there's a, uh, quite a bit of flexibility around this. Um, we did several things. One, uh, we, we typically held uh, at least monthly meetings with the primary care teams and we reviewed cases. Um, that, that seemed to go over uh, quite well. Um, you know, it, some of the uh, providers really were, were not um able to to spend a lot of time on this and and they said look just uh let me know what's going on with my with my patients and that's fine um we can do that we can just uh we can send a report monthly either to the, to the clinic to the primary care to the pulmonary clinic uh, we could send a, a report to the health plans we can uh we can do both um so we can kind of flex up or down however much uh, engagement um people want um from a 
sort of a scheduled uh, regular touch point uh, standpoint. But in terms of exacerbations, and I think that's probably what's what's most important, some patients have felt comfortable, you know, I got this, I know how to reach my, my provider. You know, we agreed that, look, you're having a flare up, uh, it's, it's time to activate your action plan and um, take those rescue medications. Uh, but I would say the majority of time patients had a hard time uh, getting in touch with their provider. And so um, our care coordinator uh, would actually call directly and, and get in touch with um, a nurse or uh, somebody else at the clinic. So we were uh, very intentional about setting up lines of communication to make sure that we could um, connect. Again, because if you can't connect patients with the care that they need, um, you're going to be limited in what you can do. But I would say that one of the things that we learned from this experience is that a lot of patients really still, even if they have a regular doctor, whether it's primary care or pulmonary, um, have a hard time getting in touch with them. And so um, we realized that essentially we need a, a virtual full first pulmonary clinic um, with providers of our own. And so we've built that. And that's that's something that we'll take forward and, um, um, and improve um, what we're able to do. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. And just as a reminder, take down my email address. We'll do a follow up as well. But if you have any questions that we don't get to or want to have a conversation with us, certainly reach out to me. I'll be happy to set that up. Uh, one more question in the chat before we end up. We have three minutes left. It is, what are ways to measure impact in the ways that aren't easily quantifiable? Mike, that seems like a question for you. Yeah, yeah, that's a that is a question. That is a crucial question. Um, I think I touched on some of this in one of the one of the previous slides, but um, there, there are key performance indicators, obviously, and it depends on the type of solution that we're delivering. Um, I mentioned kind of a progression associated with awareness, um, activation, enrollment uh, rates, uh, but also a clinical protocol that, that informs what are the expected inputs and outputs that an individual needs to have in the solution. It's not easy to choreograph this, but you need kind of a, a pairing. So Dr. Harker complimented me. We need a you need a great, you know, clinical oversight in terms of what your protocol is and a way to actually implement it so that you can know when biomarkers are off, but also an engagement protocol so you know when engagement is off and when to do something about it, because the last thing you want to do is fire off millions of signals into a household and burn a channel. And so uh, those are things that you got to monitor uh, fairly closely and have a lot of automation on the front end so that you're using that as a first line. And this way you don't have to overstaff a manual live team to look at all the data and figure out what's going on. Uh, some of the other things would be, you know, health status uh, through questionnaires, um, self-reported uh, questionnaires like a COPD action plan. Um, net promoter scores, obviously. Um, but other things like acute and macro barriers. So there are acute barriers associated with managing COPD, things that are directly related to the condition, and then macro barriers. And sometimes they're referred to as SDOH, social, social determinants of health, but that's not all of them. But if you're able to actually alleviate some of those barriers and actually monitor that over time, both the acute and the macro, then you're actually able to start moving the population in a direction where they can actually deploy some self-efficacy because you're not going to be able to be there all of the time. Um, and self-efficacy needs to be part of the, the, um, the uh, give and take. So uh, to summarize, engagement metrics like um, how, how active and, and uh, how, how frequently are they answering questions, uh, output of engagement both on the self-reported and on, let's say, the biomarker side. Um, things like health status, and a variety of different tools you can use from a self-reported standpoint, uh, net promoter scores, but also the alleviation of acute and macro barriers associated with managing COPD. Now, those can be effective strategies in, in assessing performance even as you wait for clinical outcomes to come on the back end. Thanks, Mike. It looks like we're out of time. I will toss it back to our friends at AHEP. To our speakers, thank you for that great presentation and for sharing your thoughts. 
and thank you to the audience for participating in today's webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.